would like to start by expressing my excitement and happiness to be invited to this very distinguished presentation. I, I feel honored to be invited for this occasion. And I must say my visit is a very opportune one because it is the first time in my life that I have encountered snow in all the parts of South Africa. I, I can't fail to mention that because I was so happy to see snow, not in a television, not in a book, but it actually tried playing here. I insisted that I should be taken to a frozen lake when I visited that. Because those are experiences, I'm not sure I'll get them another time. It's an opportune time, so uh, it's really an experience for me. Uh, it is also my first time to be in Kichiba, the second time in the U.S. The first time I, I went to Madison Eastern Conference. I'm so privileged, and I thank my friend Hart for the invitation. I know we last met in Barcelona very many years ago in the Uni Network Conference when we had a presentation together, and uh, from that continued interacting like scholars in the same field of community engagement. We speak the same language, especially in that sense. So the presenters that are coming here and those that have come before, I certainly know them. Those are people in the engagement. So I do believe the invitation was very selective and focused on people who speak the same language. I am equally happy that I think I have, over the week, been interacting with people of similar interest, quite stimulating, because back home, I do a lot of administrative work, and it is not usually nice where staff are fighting about money, or they are conspiring. Even now, as I was coming, they sent me another email note, that there is another money you do not pay. Now, which one again? So it's, it, it takes you away from the academic excitement. But over this week, I have had a very good stimulation. Um, the introduction says I'm the first Bukiri Vice Chancellor of Guinea University. That was right at the time of the invitation. Uh, and that is not a newspaper, that I'm now the Vice Chancellor of Guinea University. Now the Vice Chancellor of Guinea University, and I did this on purpose because uh, coming from Makere University, which is a well-set institution already ingrained in academic tradition of what I should say, London, University of London knowledge. I thought I had no place there because they don't admire those of us who talk community engagement. They don't admire those of us who talk lifelong learning. They don't admire people like us who talk about expanded access, alternative entry schemes. They want hot mainstream academia, positive research, positive scholars, especially those from psychology, think we are not academic. I don't know how the discussion is uh, in Michigan State University, but with the visible presence of the engagement department. I do believe the scholars here are a little different. And my interaction with, as I move around, I certainly realize uh, Michigan State University has a lot to do with the community, has a lot to do with changing lives in the community. Of course, I was surprised that that should also be the agenda here, while in our imagination, America is already hot headed. They are already there. Everybody is aspiring to be like Americans. So what do they have to do with engagement? They should go for the positivist scholarship and not engagement. But I realize that these problems, problems of humanity exist everywhere. So my presentation today is focusing on the role of universities in conflict resolution. In universities and community in conflict resolutions and social justice issues in Africa, the case of Guru University. So the presentation is going to be based on our experience in Guru University in trying to address this problem. 
this is not an hypothetical presentation. It's a presentation based on the real life experience of the university. There are reports out of what the staff are doing and what we encourage them to do. And this is only from one institute. I will also try to reflect on those from the Faculty of Medicine, Faculty of Agriculture, Education, Business and Development Studies. Uh, it is only the Faculty of Law which is still new. We haven't yet figured out how they should go and engage with the community. Uh, because we do not encourage very much the retributive justice system. But the law faculty is based on that kind of uh, justice system. So we are trying to see if I can get a professor from South Africa who will come and preach the kind of justice systems which we would prefer. Uh, I would like to start by talking, showing the map of Africa and indicating where Uganda is on the African continent. I presume everybody knows where Africa is. And this, I just had to add it because in my interaction they were asking a lot of questions about where, where is Gulu? Where is Gulu? So I said, okay. I think I should start by pulling out the whole of the African continent, which is obviously known, and then locate Uganda there. That is Uganda in East Africa. East Africa now includes Rwanda and Burundi. We are trying to include Southern Sudan as well. I think they are also joined. So East Africa will now be big. It will go all the way engulfing Southern Sudan because their interaction is mostly to Uganda, then Kenya. Just like ours is also, we are trying to connect all these countries, mostly of similar people. Now, Gulu, or northern Uganda, is exactly where I'm pointing. That's where northern Uganda is. Maybe we go to the next map, then i show you where Gulu is. Gulu, that town is Gulu. That is Kitgum, that is Pade. So northern Uganda, if we follow this Nile down there, and then from here, I don't know how to define it, but I think it goes like that. Because Eastern Uganda cuts across like that. No, yeah, Eastern Uganda. Then Western Uganda is this side. Central Uganda, where most of you go and stop. See here. Makerere and Kampala and Entebbe are all here. Now, Uganda is not yet an autonomous entity. All these, all these towns must commute to Kampala. All of them must move to Kampala for a lot of issues. Still a central life. That means the city of Kampala is still the most important city. Gulu, I think, sooner or later will acquire the status of a city. And uh, the university is located there. The university has campus there. The university has another campus this way. But uh, we are still trying to resolve the whole of this area doesn't have a university, but uh, universities spread like that, and then it comes this way. So we think if we argue with government, we can establish a campus there, which is a completely different region. So this is the area of northern Uganda which we are talking about. Now, the interesting bit about this area and southern Sudan is something which we still need to learn. There is a belt, if I can go back. There is a conflict belt in Africa, which runs, I think, from Somali. Runs from Somali, passes northern Nigeria. I think it goes like that. Now, then, like that. I think Cameroon is coming in. Congo is in. Then it cuts northern Uganda. Even this section of Kenya, because of the nearness with Somali, has some problem. So you can see that we are in the conflict zone. So that is an obvious story you must be hearing about. So we have what we call a conflict belt running like that. Sometimes when we get uh, the eclipse, the eclipse was also running like that. So it's almost following the conflict zone. So I do not know why those areas are problematic. So in this area, we have been 
experiencing a lot of war. I personally come from this area. Uh, my village is around there, where that red dot is. So you see, it's very close to the Nile, I think on that road. Very close to the Nile. That's why I say the Nile. This part of the Nile is almost like a lake. The, the water is stable. And all our lives just going to get some resources from the Nile. So I live from there, and I thought maybe working in Kampala is already well established. It will not make me contribute sufficiently. I'd rather go back and contribute to my community. And that is where Gulu is located. I believe you can make sense. This is Tanzania. This is Kenya. This is Rwanda. This is Democratic Republic of Congo. And for them, they also have conflict in this area going up down to Rwanda and southern Sudan. Uh, I would like to talk about Gulu University. Just to introduce, this is our emblem. The elephant. And then, uh, knowledge it is, but it also became controversial with other regions that never grew. Because the elephant was used as a symbol of the Acholi community by the British colonialists. They, they identified the different communities, and they put symbols. The Madi is a cock. The Langis is a rhinoceros, something like that. So when they used this symbol, which had nothing to do with the, the British uh, arrangements in identifying the different communities, it became controversial, it became political. But we insisted and continued to use it. Uh, the elephant normally makes a lot of calls, trumpet. We are inviting all other people. So Gulu University has as its motto for community transformation. And that is what attracted me. So every university has its motto as for community transformation. Not like that of Makerere, which says we build for the future. And Professor Ali Mazrui at one time said, the future is waiting to build Makerere. Because it was collapsing. Maybe they are now building for the future. So for community transformation is what we should talk about. This resonates well with the engagement philosophy. A university that is set for addressing the problem of the community. And what are these problems? Now, I take you back to northern Uganda. You have already seen it. Northern Uganda, uh, particularly the Acholi subregion, the Acholi subregion is what I was trying to show you. There are many communities in that area. The actual sub-region is the whole of this area. The Luo speakers, the actual sub-region, has been engaged in a lot of what? War. Has been engaged in a lot of war for the last 25 years. For the last 25 years, as I've already said. What kind of war? You must have heard about the Lord Resistance Army. It has something to do with religion. You have heard that of Boko Haram. It has something to do with religion. This one started as a resistance against the current government of President Yoweri Museveni. Before this war, the northerners, people from that area, were dominating government. But over time, they were pushed out of government. They were pushed out of the military. And they did not like that because livelihood, the main livelihood of the people in that region, again, the design of the British colonial system, in that the south was to provide labor. And if you need the south as a source of labor, then the people, to keep them on check, cannot come from the same community. So they used the north as a military reserve for them to control the laborers should they want to go on strike. And where there are machineries of coercion, the guns and what have you. And that means power also lies there. Because they are the ones in charge. They are controlling the workers. So because of that, the geopolitical arrangement was not making the southern people happy. And they had to mobilize themselves and kick the northerners out of the military and take control of the military. They were already out of 
the labor force, the civil service. And with the loss of their major source of income, which is being in the force, by the force I mean by the army, the police, the prison service, the security service, the guard service. They still dominate the guard service in Uganda. But the guard service is guard service. It's not dangerous. With that loss of income, my father particularly was a police officer. So my school fees was being paid from police salary. My uncles were in the army. Okay. And that is what we knew. We grew up to be in the army or in the police. My ambition was also to be a police officer or join the army. So my father stopped me, said, be a teacher. Because everywhere around you, my brothers are in the army up to now. They are, they are retiring from the army. That was our source of income. So definitely, people didn't like it, and they had to go into resistance. And the resistance took 25 years. The resistance mutated. The government made an effort to negotiate with the displaced professional soldiers. They brought them. Then it mutated into civilians taking over and expressing resentment. And then it mutated into people who claim religious affiliations, like Kony himself. And that one stayed until he was kicked out to Garamba. So the impact of the, conf the armed conflict, at least with all countries, resulted into a lot of the dislocation of the population leading to internally displaced people's come. And uh, the degeneration of the society in terms of the distortions of the norms, the normal setup that permitted the operation of groups, cultural norms. All these got broken down. The relationships got broken down. General traumatization of the society and the individual as a whole. Forced migration to escape war. A lot of people crossed over to Bunyoro. They crossed Karuma to Bunyoro, and they established themselves there to run away from the war. So relationships got broken down. And therefore, the need for reconciliation, healing, and restitution was very important. And this had to be achieved. How do you achieve it? Gulu University was therefore founded in that kind of uh, uh, context for which it is playing a critical role, for which it is playing a critical role. It was the liberated institute to calm the community, to reduce their disappointment, and possibly discourage them from resistance. That was in 2002. Now, I would like to talk about education and conflicts. What is a while education does not cause war, it also doesn't end them. Every education has the potential either to increase or reduce the conditions that contribute to violence. So education contributes to rebuilding broken societies and keep healing of the psychosocial wounds of war, social conflicts, as well as solve youth unemployment or youth dislocation. And we believe that education delivers decentralization of service, as it builds community capacity to fend for themselves and ensures that people participate in democracy. Education can also build peace, promote economic as well as social development. Now, Guli University was created to do just that as a higher institution of learning, and that is what it is doing through community university engagement. Some expert would call it university community social responsibility. That's what we are doing in Gulu. And uh, if I can expand a little bit, the faculties that were created were deliberately meant to do that. So for now, we still do not have the faculty of arts and social science, because we think that may not contribute immediately to the restoration of a broken society uh, from war. So we have the faculty of education to improve the schools. 
the faculty of medicine improved the health of the people, the prosthetic limbs, you would see those, and all those other rehabilitation as the, the medical service collapsed. We have the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies. Key, those are the early faculty. Faculty of agriculture to improve the agriculture. And uh, the faculty of science was created to support faculty of education. But we also have humanities within the faculty of education. Again, those humanities focus on teaching subjects that go on in secondary school. And recently we added faculty of law, which I say we have not yet got them on board to participate in the community engagement. They are still at the level of formula, and we believe time we shall push them in the direction which we want them to proceed. So armed conflict that lasted 25 years. Those are soldiers of the government. They were moving all around. They were moving all around looking for rebels. And that became a physical, it became the social setup of the community. I personally was abducted. I stayed in the bush for one week. I was already in the university when this thing started. And you can see I'm growing old now. That means it has been around. My university life is about 25 years. That means, and for all those 25 years, I was not at home. And that's why I decided to go back. When I was abducted, they recruited me. I was an intelligent officer. So one day, they sent me to, if I can divert a bit, to investigate an attack of the soldiers. So the soldiers shoot around, but I realized I was near home. So I decided to go under the grass and stay there. My company thought I was already shot because they had guns. So they also took off and they ran away. They sent report at home that this gentleman is dead. At night, I appeared home, told my mother, it is time to go back to the university. I had to walk back to town and walk back to Kampala. And I never went back. So the experience is not good at all. Those are the soldiers. These are the, the rebels. This is how they dress. Dreadlock, this is not clear. Very intimidating looks. This is the, the insurgents. I could have been looking like this if I had not escaped. I don't know whether I would still be alive or dead. This is the kind of settlement that people were burst into. I did not stay in these camps because I, I went into the university and the university was kind enough to keep us there until we finished university education. From university education as a teacher, I went to a secondary school and settled there. I didn't know what was happening with my parents. But they were staying in this kind of settlement. You see? And in this kind of settlement, some dynamics was being generated. Because here, the issue of this is my space, that is yours, please don't cross here, became very important. And that changed the land relationship, as we are going to discuss. So this is a, an aerial view. You see, these are not mushrooms or they're not seeds. These are hats. You can see they're arranged. Now, the reason why people were burst into this kind of settlement is twofold. One, to ensure that they do not provide food for the rebels. And secondly, and I think that was the most strong reason, and the other reason, which is the diplomatic reason which the government gives, is to protect them from being harmed by the rebels. But the issue is control them so that rebels don't have access to food. But this also became dangerous, because you can see all these are grass such houses. The rebels will attack this location, touch one house, and you know what happens. It's an inferno created. And they still got their food, because Another thing was happening in this place. People were not in their normal economic activities of peasant farming. So World Food, WFP, all the relief organizations were coming to give them food. And human beings will continue.
children were being produced in that context. And that created another group of youth who are now mature. 25 years in this kind of settlement, they have grown up. And all they know is depending on food handouts and not cultivation. And that also reconfigured their land relationship or their relationship with the land and their attitude with the land. They don't see land as a resource from which you can draw livelihood, but they see land as a disposable commodity. Because if these two want to leave, they will sell off that space to another needy person. And from that, they acquire the concept that land can be sold and bought. And that was germinating problems or initiating problems, which we shall later discuss. Uh, Landmines, some were not landmines, some were deliberate chopping of hands, cutting of leaves. They cut your leaves, the rebels, so that you don't go and report them. Your hands, if you pick an arrow against them. So with landmines and what have you, we have this. And our faculty of medicine is already doing quite a lot in processing lean recovery, together with some civil society. We are participating. As recent as a few weeks, I was launching some projects about this, trying to ensure that those who have lost limbs can live normal life. The university is playing that role. But this time, I'm not going to talk about the medical uh, community engagement approach. I'm going to talk about peace and conflict resolution. There were a lot of efforts by a number of NGOs to ensure that reconciliation is achieved. You can see that is a poster showing that a rebel, you can see their air, is being welcomed back. And this involves many institutions, religious organization, the military, and the surrendering rebels bringing back their guns homes there. This is a rebel being welcomed back to the family. So all this forgiveness, love, and reconciliation was the agenda that was being preached, involving all the stakeholders. Uh, in. So a lot of things were being done in order to calm the community from that conflict situation. But as I said, the conflict even the military bit was mutating. It started with the professional soldiers fighting a rare guard battle to keep off the onslaught of the national resistance movement of uh, Museveni. And then it mutated to civilians, people who have never been to the military, fighting back. And it mutated. I should not even say there were religious organizations. There were just people who believed in witchcraft they took over. And Korn is another one. He practices a lot of witchcraft mixed with religion, Catholicism, to say the least. So what are we saying here now? So Gulu University is one of the public universities in Uganda, established in 2002, at the height of the local insurgents, uh, which is treated by the Lord's resistance. Army against the national resistance government. We have nine public universities. As I said, I don't know whether to say nine or ten, because one is just uh, an independent constituent college of Makere University, which is same autonomous. Then Gulu is one of them. Gulu was the third public university created after Barra. Yeah, it was established to foster sustainable development and contribute to peace and reconciliation in the war ravaged region of northern Uganda. The university responded to this task by creating a specialized academic unit, okay, called the Institute. Academic unit, Institute, respond to specific issues from both the theoretical and practical perspective. We bring in, as a university, the research mentality, to find out what can work and what cannot work. These returning rebels 
as you are seen. When they come to families like that, they join their families, that they could have participated in killing somebody in the next door family. So reconciliation is required there. Because to ensure that you do not go back, like if I had stayed longer than that, to ensure that I do not go back to my community and integrate, they take you to the neighboring home and make sure you do some damage there so that you can't go back and you are not now able to what? To leave the group. Fortunately, I escaped before that happened. Now, the war is ending and you are going back. And the neighbors are still there. And this, these neighbors, when we say neighbors, they're not like your neighbors who are strangers. They are cousins. They are your relatives. Maybe your uncles. They make sure you go and kill your uncles, kill your cousins, so that you don't fit there. This is a very terrible logic. So, this had to be done. So, through research, we had to find out what would be the most suitable social solutions to the social conflicts arising out of the military conflict. When the guns were going silent, of course, the university started entering. And I can say, we also wanted to upgrade our conflict studies, including military studies. And the government said, no, don't go there. What authority do you have to do military studies or military strategies? Because we thought peace, we should understand all elements of peace, whether force by force or whether by negotiation, by diplomacy, or by, by whatever means. We wanted to engage in that, but they told us, don't. Leave that for the government. We tried to argue that, no. Ours is peace. We were going to train the security service to maintain peace and then tell them not really the military bit, but uh, how to be in the army, the rights of the civilian, how to protect those rights of the civilian in battle, the rights of the surrendering soldiers, the UN resolutions and what have you, which the military may not have access to. If they said, no, don't. So we remain with human rights studies and issues of other alternative justice systems, which we are going to come to. Now, the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies. So in, in 1992, in, the, in response to the conflict and conflict afflicting the region, and the need for peace building, reconciliation, healing, and restitution, the university established first what we call the Center for Conflict Management and Peace Studies. You can see that this university is shaping itself, is cutting itself as a, a community responsive university. In other words, an engaged university. So this was one of the first unit, academic unit created. So the center later became the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies in 2007. The institute now promotes an interdisciplinary, action-oriented, and community-centered approach to research in conflict prevention, management, resettlement, resolution, social cultural restitution, trans transformation, and peace building. So the institute responded to this challenge by establishing itself as a focal point for intellectual inquiry focal point for intellectual inquiry and action-oriented research and community university engagement or outreach programming activities in the field of peace, conflict strategy studies, strategic studies, development, humanitarian intervention, and any other discipline that bears relevancy to the interest of peace building and the need of the conflict affected that is what the Institute is doing. And uh, I can tell you the greatest proportion of the Institute work is research. The report is out there. And we will see how the conflict arising from this armed conflict mutated into social conflict, mutated into other forms of conflict, including animals. And the Institute is dealing with that up to now. 
The number of students in the institute is small. In the last meeting we had with staff, they joked that the number of staff is bigger than the number of students, which is true. Because they only do folks registered. We thought undergraduate may not have a proper appreciation of conflict studies. But the president is also on us. He says Gulu University is the most rebellious university. He doesn't want conflict studies. And we have looked the other way and continued to do conflict studies. And we are going to expand it. I, I have defended it in front of him. He says, sir, you can stop conflict studies in other places, but not in Gulu University. Then he says, OK, for you case, I see, I will understand for now, but not for long. Oh, are you going to study conflict? Are you going to have conflict everywhere? I say, yes, we are coming from a situation of conflict. Maybe we shall go to Nigeria to do conflict studies. We shall go to Somalia to do conflict studies. We shall go to wherever, where the Sudan, just in the north, has com conflict issues. So conflict is not about to end. And we are going also into studying domestic violence, domestic conflict, all manners of conflict that we can attend to in the community. So the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies is a new instrument for civil society-based peace building promotion within Gulu University, framework of community transformation. It is an innovative intervener in peace and reconciliation work involving civil society and community initiative. And in some case, the armed forces. We engage with the armed forces. And that's why we wanted military conflict studies military strategy. We will still continue to negotiate with them. The Institute is a major agent of institutional change in the process of contributing towards improved community peace and enjoyable livelihood in a region that has been severely traumatized by decades of atrocious armed conflict, which has now degenerated into land and social conflict. The rebels, as I said, they are in Garamba. They have not yet been annihilated. Garamba, they are going into uh, the Central Republic of Africa, very far now. When Sudan became peaceful, they went deeper. They may soon find, if Cameroon situation doesn't, they may find themselves in Cameroon. So you can see how they are moving. So the Institute of Peace and Strategic Studies engages in international, regional, and national collaborative partnership and networking for peace and conflict resolution work. We engage with any stakeholder interested in this subject. IPJSS is an open space and forum for training uh, and for experiencing of new methods and tools in peace and conflict resolution work, creating and reinforcing new capacities and capabilities in peace building as a genuine catalyst for change and restoration within affected communities. That is what we are doing. So there are a lot of projects. The, 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 the IPS Community Outreach Peace Project is one of them, which conducted in collaboration with the German Development Service and its civil peace service program engaged in practical grassroots peace building and cross-border reconciliation all over northern Uganda and northeast Uganda with the overall goal of to transform communities in northern Uganda for positive and sustainable peace through documentation, information, and outreach programming. So that is one of the projects. We call it COP. The objectives are there to support community-based peace building and promotion of development. Community-based peace building, this we shall come into the detail. Information and documentation, this is the normal thing people do. Do a bit of advocacy and social justice issues. National development, promotion of national development and social justice issues. Yeah, to achieve this, we adopted what we call innovative multi-programming approach for productivity in the community transformation process to blend theory and practice in the peace training activities in the communities. Now, one of the most important strategies was the traditional justice system. The traditional justice system currently being used to promote peace, reconciliation, restitution, and healing in the traumatized region of Uganda is a traditional justice system. 
what we call alternative justice system. It's called matoput. Matoput is a local language, which means drinking of a bitter root herb. I tried to look for the botanical name of Uput, but uh, I, I couldn't get it because Uput is uh, the local name. And trying to figure out how that is came. But the, 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 the plant extract is extremely bitter. It's a bitter herb. Then there is stepping on eggs. These are ritual activities. These are not medicinal ceremonies or herbs. They are therapeutic reconciliation herbs. It's more symbolic than uh, uh, it's more symbolic than treatment related. The bitterness is not for cure. The bitterness is for psychological. That to keep bitterness in your heart is that difficult. You need to get rid of it. So it is symbolic. The drinking of this bitter root extract is to symbolize the start of healing process. After a bitter disagreement, that must be bitterly swallowed and then forgotten. So you swallow. You swallow the bitter root extract. You're not supposed to split it. Because splitting is, is a rejection of the negotiation. So you swallow it and say, this has already been swallowed. And we are not going back to this disagreement. The cutting of sheep into two halves, sharing it. The sacrificial lamb. That will put aside the enmity. We have shared the fish, the, the, the sheep, bitterness, and we have shared the bitterness between the two parties. So this will put is drunk in the, the calabas. I decided to bring one. They put it in the calabas, and you got to drink. So you can see the calabas. I asked somebody if he knew the calabas. He said, why? They pour it in. It should not be drunk in a metallic pot or any modern thing. It should be kept within its traditional context. So it is mixed there. And then the goats and the sheep are done. They just cut into two without spilling. And a little terrifying. The sacrificing of sheep before Matuput and then Matuput. These are representative of the two sides. If you bring down your head like this and you drink together. So you've drunk the bitterness from the same calabas. You are now one people. No single party must disengage from this ceremony. Watch the hands. Watch. My hands are at my back. No more fighting. No more I am peaceful. Of course, I know within the modern concept, peace is by putting up your hands like this. But in our culture, you put it at the back. Of course, at the back may symbolize that you are still hiding a knife behind you. So, and member will drink the bitter herb in turn. And how did this come about? It is from the realization that the modern justice system is not believed in. If somebody kills somebody and is taken to prison, the victim will lie low and just wait for this person to come out. It does not matter how long. Because they have no connection with the judicial system. They have no belief in it. They just wait to take their revenge. Or they may even extract their revenge before that person comes out. But when they do this, 
It inheres into their way of life, their belief systems, and they, they understand it, and it makes sense, and it is complete. Because it engages their spirituality, it engages their being. I know the Christian religious practice has been around for a long time, but it has not taken that deep root. To, dis to stop a person from ignoring it. But this is not ignorable. Because if you disengage yourself from this, then they say the misfortune may not be visited on you, but it will be visited. It combines those already dead, the spirit, those still there, and those still to be born. That is how strong the belief is. So in order to protect the entire generation, those who have passed, including the ones who could have been killed, those who are present, and those still to be born, you cannot ignore this ritual. In other words, the bonding is much stronger than the punishment that is executed. Restoration of relationship. This has been performed. Relationship is restored back. This is a restorative justice as compared to retributive punishment justice. It's restored and completely restored. You become like you are one people. not the retributive promoted by the criminal justice system. After the restoration of relationship, it is believed that any party that will go against the agreement will be punished, not by humans, but by the gods. So you cannot even sneak and do something wrong because the gods are watching you. The spirits are watching you. The ancestors are watching you. They will visit misfortune on such a person together with his or her family, clan, and his descendants. This shows you that there are four parties involved in this process. The elders who are the mediators, the traditional leaders, not the judge. We don't believe in the judge. The intervener, these are the mediators, or the intercessors. The intercessors are also there, the spiritual leaders. They are the link between the spirit and the humans. And then the victims, and then the offenders, and lastly, the spirits and the gods are all party to this ceremony. And all the above sits within the acceptably recognized cultural context and belief systems of the community, without which this practice will have no meaning or effect. Now, the collective justice system in which punishment is by the gods and the ancestral spirit is visiting on the entire community entire clan of the offending party. The offending party in this case is not the other offending party, but the one who goes. If you are the victim and then you go against the commitment, then you become the offending party. This time, it is the gods that will deal with you. Uh, it is incumbent upon the entire family, the clan, to ensure that nothing goes wrong. This brings in the concept of collective justice, collective responsibility. This concept of collective justice is in line with the philosophy of Ubuntu Z, which what we call Udando in the Luo dialect. That is a person. We are a person. This concept ties all aspects of human life, involving everything, everybody, unborn, alive, the dead, the spiritual, the living, uh, are all involved. So in this, you can see that the dead are actually active, are active in securing the well-being of the living and the unborn. There is no loser, no winner after this. Everybody. The folding of hands, I've already talked about that. They all drink with their hands folded to their back, symbolizing no further harm in terms of continued aggression by the culprit or revenge by the victim. There is no winner, no loser, except reconciliation, restoration of relationship, and restitution. And this must be demonstrated in your everyday life. However, the offender and his family 
normally give some compensation to the offended for their loss. In the case of death, this is called chulukuo. There are many other ceremonies. When the rebel comes back home, he steps on the eggs. When the ritual is performed, you wash your face, to symbolize the washing of tears. Then the anointing for cleansing. This is again cleansing. Uh, forget about these ones, are the local language. Bending of spears. And then cessation of hostility. All this. There you can see somebody is coming back. Okay. Stepping on. He has been away. He was, say, as, as I said, you kill your neighbor, God be will come back peacefully. But not before the other ceremonies are finished. So you will come back home. Some small ceremonies perform. The brother ran away and left the home after the conflict. Comes back home. is restored in the home. The issue is restoration, restoration, restoration. And that is what we have been doing. Now, this stage was dealing with the immediate impact of the armed conflict. Now, there are other conflicts that are now coming up. Youth. I told you these youth were depending on handouts. They were born within the context of handouts. They did not see their parents go to the farm. They want to continue living the same life. Land conflicts arising out of the changed land relations. This is what is currently going on. I didn't want to start giving the details of how these are being handled. You find still a neighbor who wants to claim the, the, the cousin's land to sell it off. Just waits when the family is sleeping at night and goes and touch the grass thatch house and makes sure that they all die. Still going on. So during the war, people realized that land can be sold. So the communal concept of land ownership has also died. Now we are busy engaged. The reports are all there. Now, human-animal land conflicts. As people move into those camps, the animals took over the remaining space. Because people are now concentrated in small sections. Concentrated, concentrated, concentrated. The animals came and took over. The elephants came and took over. The snakes took over. When the war ended, people were going back. Snake was killing people. And that became another intervention to ensure that people keep away from snakes and snakes don't kill. So as people return to their home, found that the original homes were taken over, the elephants are particularly aggressive and arrogant because they are large. Now, people went home, and in our traditional setting, you share a house with your chicken and what have you, and the chicken is particularly stubborn when even at night they will hear a huge presence of the elephant and then it will make a noise. The elephant doesn't like that. And it's, it's a very small noise. You know the chicken, I don't know whether you, well, you don't interact with chicken. So you don't know what that means. When a chicken sees kite, it will normally make that noise so that the, the, the chicks run away. But at night, it is sensitive. It makes that noise. If you hear the chicken make that noise, get out immediately because the elephant will come and rest down your building. Because it was his space. The elephant was clearing people's cassava, clearing people's bot bot potatoes to come and scoop your potatoes, trample on your chicken, trample on your goats. It was looming large. You try to chase it back, it refuses to go. It charges on you. And this is what we are dealing with now. And some of the projects that we are dealing with to, to deal with elephants is to create economic activities that can bar them. We are telling the community to, to engage in beekeeping. So in the boundary areas, separating the conservation areas and human settlement, as the elephant moved in, you put bees. Elephants don't like bees. So 
when they, they come and then they hear bees, they will go back. If you can't put bees, then you engage in chili. Now, the bees will stop the elephant, but the bees will also bring income in terms of honey. So those are the projects we are engaging in to resolve this land conflict between animals and human beings. Or oh, you grow chili. Elephants don't like chili. And then we advise the community, don't keep goats. Don't keep chicken. Because goats will attract lions. So you just keep farm. Because ele elephants don't mind, they come for the plants. Don't keep goats. So the, the, the lions will remain with the antelopes in the bush. Because antelopes run away from human beings. And the lions go to the antelope. But the goats stay with human beings, so if you keep goats, the lions will come for you as well. So if you are living near the boundaries with the animals, don't keep goats. Don't keep animals, domestic animals. You can keep dogs somehow. So we have issues of, yeah, we have issues, all these types of conflicts that are coming up. I've talked about that. Families over land ownership, I've talked about that. Conflict, families and institutions. Now, this is interesting. Churches were donated land. Schools were donated land. But because people have realized that land can be sold, they now tell the schools, go away. They now tell the missionaries, please, this was not given to you. Only take this one where your church is located. So all these conflicts are coming up. And the universities are engaged in solving. Youth and livelihood and land access. Now, the, the youth look at land as something they can sell off, buy bajaj motorbikes from India, and use it for passenger transport. But the, the reverse experience is that they get accident, the bicycle is broken, and the land is gone. We are beginning to get afraid that this generation of relief food dependents who are now mature are going to be the first generations of landless Africans. I know landlessness is in India, but we are headed for landlessness. Because big companies are coming from South Africa, sugar companies are coming from India and wherever, and are buying land massively. Plantation agriculture, which is not there. And what does that mean? You either become even the outgrower system doesn't make money. So all this is changing the entire economy of the region. Entire economy of the region. It's a complete distortion that we are trying to engage in. But sometimes we find ourselves in conflict with government. Because government brings these companies. They want the sugar. They want to increase productivity. But they are driving out people to nowhere. Now, all this we are engaging with and seeing how we can work with that. So, Gulu University, through its institute, will continue this process of documentation, continue the healing process, continue getting these projects, and also get this kind of knowledge back to the fall of the community, as well as getting it accepted as an alternative measure for the promotion of peace and restoration of the society, and creating transformation, peaceful living and development. We have journals that we are creating around the issues of peace. And uh, these journals, of course, is to interrogate the culture, both as a source and solution to the conflict transformation, um, peace building and healing. And uh, it is our hope that through this journal, issues related to conflict, peace building, reconstruction, restoration, during the post-conflict period, will be promoted in the whole of the East African region, including Southern Sudan and beyond. These efforts are in accordance with our motto, which says, for community transformation. And I would like to see to add, through community university engagement. Thank you very much.
that they are, they are done after. You start with the agreement. We at peace. Then you go to the compensation, which is also negotiated. And then you pay. The cows, the goats, it's done after. And that is, we are now at peace. Please receive this. And the acceptance of that compensation is saying, okay, it is over between us. We are now one. And you go as if the, you are people who have known each other. So it's, it's, it's all part of the process. And it must be done. And once you have gone through the, the, the matter put, you cannot now say no to the compensation. And in some cases, you got to now go and conclude the, the burial ceremonies of the person who is killed. So there are some process which the other family must also go and undertake. So it doesn't stop at the ritual things. Because in the tradition, to ensure that misfortune is visited on the offending families, you don't organize the funeral rites of the person who has been killed. Now, once that has been done, you go and you organize the funeral rite. Or you will become the offending party. So it, it is restored, and it is held in the heart. I, I do not know how to describe it. It is so real that it is finished. And it is something the judicial system, the criminal justice system cannot achieve. Because we have no relationship with the criminal justice system. The fellow goes to prison, and I am still me. I'm waiting for you. But here, when you know my ancestors are involved, the spirit are involved, it's here. Because this has been handed over generations. People believe in it. Yeah. Hello, Uh, the question says, to what extent oh, do students participate in the institute community engagement work? In what ways? Yeah, that, this, this, this is a good question. As I say, the institute is largely a research institute, and we have postgraduate students. They are equally involved. Their research projects are based on those processes. For example, we have PhD students, master's students, dealing and studying the best methods of dealing with the animal-human conflict. That's the one which is on the table. And in dealing with the animal-human conflict, one of the methods I didn't indicate was, and a student is studying that, <coughs> is if you don't go for chili, if you don't go for bees, then you do tourist attraction. You create very comfortable, affordable uh, huts, which are well facilitated, Tourists come, and in that way, you allow the animal to come in. And then you befriend the animal. You don't threaten them. Then the animals become available. And that then, you earn income. Because tourists come to see the animal. And they like to stay in unique facilities like those ones. So you earn some money without conflict. So you don't plant potatoes. Because potatoes, the elephants, will annoy you by digging it out. So yes, the students are part of the process. Their research is on that. The supervision is done by us. And the action research process they undertake is left in solving those problems. The undergraduate students are not yet there because we feel this is a rather high level uh, activity. I believe that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that comes from your understanding of land ownership. We are transitioning. I can tell you I also didn't know that land should be owned by individuals. Me. 
we are transitioning from a different relationship with land in that you only own the land for as long as you are using it. And you know, our traditional homestead system are such that if you migrate, there is no trace, there is no concrete, it is gone. Even the grass, the poles are finished. The place reverts back to bush. Now, another person will come and take over. If you move, you have moved, finished. Whatever is left here is not yours. And you don't claim that this measure, this kilometer, that kilometer is mine. It belongs to the community. You go take your animals, you graze. You want to farm, you can do farming. I say, okay, let us leave this one fallow. We go and clear the other forest. You go and clear the, uh, the forest. And then you go there, you dig. Okay, you dig, you dig. Even your garden, once you have dug, you have harvested and you have lost interest, another person can come and use it as you move on. You are tired of staying in this place. You go to another community. You get land there. Another person comes and takes over. So the modern concept of my space ends there, yours ends there, was not there. But as people went into camps, because of the squeezeness, they started realizing, no, my space. And then selling, you must sell a certain space. Now we have to oh, this thing can be sold. We thought only government could sell land, not people. And they only sell town land, not rural land. But now I can tell you there is not a single surface of land left unclaimed. And then the land, the land conflict manifests in a number of ways. A person like me, I'm not allowed to go back home and claim any land. But that is what I'm not going to accept. I'm going to also cut my piece. Because we are now cutting our pieces. Let me say we are in now a state of land grabbing. The more you grab, the better. Some people have taken over chunks and chunks of land. Because they were there when peace was resuming. Some of us were still working in Makere. So now I say, okay, I'm also going to cut mine. My brother should not come here. You go the other side. And then I bring surveyors. This is mine. So uh, you, you get what I mean. So there was no issues of contracts and interview and documentation. It was not there. It was just mutual understanding and knowledge. That's how we used to learn. So it's a transition process arising out of this distortion of conflict. And the university is engaged in the process. Some people survey land at night these days. As I was up here. They were calling me, said you must come and sign these documents and neighbors must confirm. In other words, we are still parceling the land out from a communally owned land to an individually owned land. I don't know how long this process will take, but lives are being lost in the process. So the, we are trying busy to keep people calm. Say so you distribute it properly. Distribute it properly. Some families go, they sit down. Then they distribute. Then say, now yours is here, yours is here. If you have many children, that is your problem. You know, something like that. It's a completely different concept of land relationship we are going into. And that is what we are. And all this is because of war. How often do they reject the traditional mode of resolution? I haven't heard of that. Actually, they, not really that they reject. Through study, we realize that it's only the traditional mode that can work. Because the experience tells the modern system of taking the offending party perpetuates. And then it also scares the people who, are, who have done the offense. You go to courts, and that does not solve it problem. The problem can be solved by what people believe in. So the, the mode that is accepted is the one which people believe in, which is the traditional mode. But of course, this modern land conflict, the one of modern conflict, this one which we are undergoing, people still go to courts. People still go to courts. But in going to courts, it never ends. And we are trying to ensure that we bring the, the traditional leaders who 
people believe on to come and engage with the people in the process of distributing this land to one family. At least me and my brother, we have agreed. You, you take the other hill, you, you take that one. Me, I will take this one. So there's no problem. Maybe because we are few. But huge families with many mothers have problems. Uh, I am lucky. My, my father had only one mother, so that is not a problem. So you can see that this goes even with the, it inheres in our experience completely. Yes, 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 yes. Um, there are two, two manifestations, the role of cattle. There are two kind of cattle keeping traditions that are coming up. Uh, there's the one that Robert is engaging, which is the dairy a cattle, the exotic cattle, the milk, you know. That one, the government is giving through what they call Operation Wealth Creation. They are giving, they are donating them to individuals then, you know, to have some income. That one is confined cattle keeping, like you do here. The open cattle grazing, you can only do that when you have the land. And now also, there are these pastoralists who have also migrated when land grabbing started. They have migrated, and what they, go, what they do, they go into a person who has grabbed a big parcel of land, and he has no what? He has no cattle. Say, I pay you two million shillings, not dollars. Uganda shillings, it's, 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 it's a little dollar. And I graze my cattle here for two, for five years. What they do, they say, I have 300 cattle for two, two million shillings. I have only 300 cattle. And on the following day, you wake up, there are 2,000 cattle. And then they go and do damage to the neighbors. So the, the, the local populations have complained to the president. Because we don't do fencing. In the, in the old land use, there is no fencing. There is no need for land fencing. Because everybody uses it as they wish. Now that we have gone to privatize land ownership, the president said, those who want to hire out their land for cattle must do fencing. Must do fencing. If you don't do fencing, then those who have come to hire, either those who have come to hire must do fencing. Oh, I think by the time I go back, the deadline that was still. This thing is still very current. Now, that is a new phenomenon. It's a new phenomenon. We have not yet even gone into dealing with that. Because they just keep mutating. But be, before you are dealing with this one of between families, you discover people are hiring out. They are leasing out their land for two, two years, three years. Then you say, now, how do you handle this? And then the president gives it a directives. Then the resident district commissioners begin to implement those directives. Then wherever those cattle keepers have come from, God knows asked to go back. And they ferry their animals with glory. So the people in the southern areas of Uganda, their land is already completely parceled out. So they're moving in two hours, which is still being parceled out. If this war had not occurred, maybe we had, would have taken time without parceling. Now, this is still very new. I can't tell you we are working on that. Because it's a very new conflict. The animal come, the other one is growing millet, the, the cattle go and eat them. Now, they start fighting. So, it is going on and on and on. So the cattle has is bringing another new dimension. Thank you.
yeah, there, there, there are still roles. But those are the ones the university is not interested in. We have people who are being taken to ICC, the International, the, in the Hague, International Court. People are being taken there. I think this, this one is but we do not want to encourage that. Because immediately we start encouraging that, then we lose our intervention neutrality. We want something which promotes peace, not punishment. Because that is what we, we know works. And once we start getting involved, take this one to the court, then we are in trouble. I think then the engagement stops. Engagement is about. Both sides, not telling them, take them to court. Engagement is what works for you. Uh, well, okay, if this what, how can we facilitate the process? What are the logic in it? Then we explain it to government. This is what works. It works because of this and that. These people are coming from a long tradition of believing in this, and this is what we must do. And the government does, and that works. The religious people don't like it because it is ritualistic. And it is contrary to their principles of believing in Jesus Christ, who was the last sacrifice they believe in. So we've got to negotiate our ways around all those dynamics. Sometimes you find families who don't believe in it, but you've got to get a way of promoting you know, restorations. If you get those ones which are terribly ingrained in religion, then you've got to talk about forgiveness. But that, as I told you, is not deeply set in the belief systems of the community. So yes, the government runs with that. And after this restoration is complete, and the government comes and picks a particular individual, that is now not a family feud. It is government and them. We are out of it. Thank you. list of about 20 units that they wanted me to thank. I think I'm going to give a blanket thank you to all of our units. If, and, and we do really appreciate all the ways that you contributed to, to George's visit here. So the one thing I want to make sure I do announce, though, is the March 14th date. If you could put that on your calendar. We've got the next uh, speaker here in the, in the Global Engagement Speaker Series, Maria Tapia, who's the founder and director of the Latin America Center for Service Learning in Argentina. And she'll be talking on service learning as a platform for active learning, applied research, and student participation in community development. And if you want to learn more, you can go to the website, which is gess.msu.edu. And now we can continue this rich dialogue during the reception. So please join us. Thank you. <laughs>